a very good afternoon to you. I hope you've been following along all the sessions today and really getting a lot out of this European Health Forum in 2021, all taking place, of course, remotely and online. Now, the topic of this overall event is Rise Like a Phoenix, but right now, at this point, we're going to be talking about rethinking the future of cancer care. Obviously, we take into context the COVID-19 pandemic and look at how we can build back, move forward and measure improvements, because that's really key to understanding what sort of progress we are meeting, making. Now, we're going to take a sort of innovative format here. We want you, the audience, to really get involved and to really give us your thoughts and, in fact, even direct the direction of our conversation today. We're going to actually hear a keynote speaker. Then we've got some excellent panelists for you, but we're going to allow you to determine the topics. But before we get to all of that, I really do want you to welcome with me Mark Lawler, who is going to be our opening keynote speaker. He's going to set the stage, tell you what the scene is, and really help to let us know what it is we want to focus on over the next few minutes and hours. So Mark Lawler is the Chair in Translational Cancer Genomics and the Dean of Education at the Faculty of Medicine, Health and Life Sciences in Queen's University, Belfast in Northern Ireland. So Mark, at that, I'm going to hand over the floor to you and let you uh, work your wonder and really get our audience fired up and keen to vote on the next topics. Jennifer, thank you very much indeed. Um, what I'd like to do first of all is to take you back I'm going to take you back to the 29th of March, 2020. And that day for me is actually a very personal day because unfortunately on that day, my uncle died of a COVID related illness. But the reason why I share this information with you is because one of my colleagues from Croatia, Edward Badoliak, who's an oncologist there, while reaching out with, to me to sympathize with me on my loss, shared this shocking statement with me. He said to me that people were fearing a COVID diagnosis more than a cancer diagnosis. And that really worried me. And I asked myself, is this actually true? Is there any data out there to suggest that this is the case or to refute this statement? And so we reached out initially right across the United Kingdom to actually capture data and to see what was the impact of COVID on cancer care and on cancer patients. And unfortunately, what we found was very worrying. We found that seven out of 10 individuals with a suspicion of cancer were not being seen by cancer services in an appropriate time. We found that four out of 10 people, patients who were receiving chemotherapy were again not receiving it at the proper time due to the impact of COVID. We reached out to both the European Cancer Organization and the European Cancer Patient Coalition. The European Cancer Organization immediately set up a special network on COVID-19 and cancer, which I am proud to co-lead with Miriam Krul from the Netherlands. And what we did was initially we produced a seven point plan, a plan to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 and to use that information and to be data driven to actually bring us out of the crisis. So again, like Jennifer said, like Phoenix rising from the ashes. We also decided it was very important to collect more data not just from the UK, but on a European basis in order to inform our discussions and also to inform a campaign that we started in relation to COVID-19 and cancer. Some of the data that we found was really worrying. 100 million, yes, that's not a misprint, 100 million cancer screening tests missed in Europe. 1 million European citizens who may be walking around with an undiagnosed cancer. So they may not know that they have cancer. And also the tremendous impact that COVID-19 has had on the healthcare system. Four out of 10 workers are burnt out, three out of 10 showing signs of depression. What really worried me was the fact that we've done so well over the last number of years in terms of improving five-year projected survival for cancer. And what we saw when we looked in lung, in breast, in colorectal particularly, was that that five-year improvement was actually going backwards. So rather than going forwards in terms of getting better outcomes for cancer, we were actually seeing the potential that COVID-19 could actually have an impact so we would actually see worse outcomes over a five-year period. And that really worried us. 
the European Cancer Patient Coalition reached out globally, brought together 320 organizations to sign a joint letter on COVID-19 and cancer. And the European Cancer Organization set up a time to act campaign to really reach out to European citizens and to European governments and to say, we really need to change. We reckon that we need to be working at 130% of capacity to actually clear the backlog, for example, in diagnosis. Cancer won't wait, so we can't wait either. It's time to act, and that time to act is now. Don't let cancer become the forgotten sea in the fight against COVID. And although we've had a difficult 18 months, we now have a supreme opportunity. We have an opportunity to rethink our cancer services and our cancer care for our patients, to make them better than they were before. I'm not interested in going back to the, the old normal. I want a new normal, a new better normal for cancer patients and for cancer services in Europe. And in order to do that, we need to use data and turn it into intelligence that actually informs where we are going forward and also measures how we improve and delivers for our patients. Thank you very much, Mark. That was a very impassioned call to arms, absolutely really setting out where we need to be. Um, I think you're very clear in what you're saying about how we need to actually really put the focus on cancer. I mean, COVID-19, let's be honest, it has showed us that when we put our minds to something, we can actually get there. So thank you very much for that. Now, as I said, this is going to be a very interactive session. We are going to use a tool called Slido. You may have been using it all afternoon. So it's just go to slido.com on your browser. There's no need to download anything. There's no need to register. It's very privacy friendly. You can either scan the QR code that you can see there on your screen or simply put in the code for our session, which is EHFSGS4. And what we want you to do is rank them in order of your preference. You've got three options here. Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, How to Rethink Cancer Care. Measuring continued progress in cancer care would a set of jointly agreed indicators help and how health systems have adapted. What are the best practices in e-health, digital screening and reorganization of care pathways? Now I can see we have many, many attendees. We've got more than 50 people here joining online from across Europe. So we're going to give you just a moment to really vote on that. In fact, I'm going to do it as well. You can do it from your phone. You don't even have to go through the Zoom platform to do so. You've heard there what Mark had to say about what we want to do and what our overall objectives are going to be. What we want to know is which of these three topics do you want to spend a little bit more time discussing? And we're going to take the top, the top two. Uh, I'm going to wait until I get a few more votes in so that I know we've got at least half of you have voted. Um, please do go to your phones, put in that code EHFGS4. There we go. Okay, we've got more than half of you have voted. So I think it's clear to see that Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, How to Rethink Cancer Care has been the top selected and then measuring continued progress in cancer care would a set of jointly agreed indicators help? So we're going to discuss those two in a bit more depth. So I think we'll start with Europe's Beating Cancer Plan because this is something that has been on the EU agenda for a bit of time. Um, with that, I'm going to ask us uh, to our, our speakers, our panelists who are going to lead this discussion to uh, switch on their cameras and join us. We are very fortunate to have with us in this session, Antonella Cardone, the director of the European Cancer Patient Coalition. We also have Mike Marcy, the chief executive officer of the European Cancer Organization and Alexander Rudiger, the chair of the EFPIA Oncology Steering Committee. Thank you for joining us. Um, Antonella, let me start with you. We saw there the, the audience voted um, more than half of them very quickly. I appreciate the timekeeping because we only have one hour to discuss all of this. And they really want to talk about Europe's beating cancer plan. So lead us off on what your thoughts are in response to that Slido question. Thank you, Jen. Uh, so yes, the, the growing cancer burden in Europe is still one of the main health challenges that needs to be faced, uh, despite the fact that we see consistent efforts in recent years to address this. Uh, Europe has the capacity and should lead the fight to reduce the burden on cancer. 
uh, disparities uh, should be reduced uh, as well uh, because all European citizens uh, should be treated uh, equally, no matter where they were born or live in Europe. Uh, they should have the same best care available. And uh, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it became clear that it is important to invest in robust and coordinated health, in coordinated health and uh, social care systems as the only way to protect and promote uh, the health of your citizens and among them of cancer patients. So this is why we believe that Europe's beating cancer plan is a milestone, in the, is, a, is, a, is a very important uh, uh, milestone in the fight against cancer and its uh, social, financial and uh, psychological consequences uh, uh, among you citizens. Uh, so at uh, ECPC, we are pleased uh, to see that uh, the fight against uh, cancer remains a top priority of, for the European Commission, uh, despite uh, the unprecedented uh, reach and proportion of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so with uh, the Europe's uh, beating cancer plan, we are now living a momentum and we need uh, to work all together. Uh, one important point uh, uh, of the cancer plan uh, is uh, around uh, coordinated efforts among and within uh, member states. So multidisciplinary teams are key and need uh, to be established and the clear targets uh, need to be identified so that uh, the entire cancer care pathway is covered uh, from prevention, treatment, uh, follow-up and survivorship. Uh, notably, while the cancer prevention is of the utmost uh, significance, it is equally important uh, for Europe uh, to ensure the availability of high quality healthcare infrastructure, including screening, diagnostics, and treatment facilities and health services. Still, uh, treatment is available on day one in a country, Germany, for instance, and it takes years for the same treatment to be available in other countries in Europe. So huge disparities also exist in cancer screening and access to new diagnostic tools. And this is uh, uh, inconceivable for us. So we believe uh, that uh, the inequalities registry introduced by the Europe's uh, Beating Cancer Plan is a very important tool and we're looking forward uh, to its full implementation. And to conclude, uh, I want uh, uh, also like uh, to, uh, to stress uh, that uh, we need uh, to um, uh, monitor the uh, implementation and success, success of the uh, Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. Thank you, Antonella. And let me remind the audience again, use that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you have a question to any of our speakers. We have a very packed schedule, so make sure you get your questions in as soon as possible. Mike, let me turn to you uh, and give us your thoughts on uh, the EU Cancer Plan. Personally, this was the last live event yeah. I moderated before COVID. And I remember standing there in the Parliament, in the European Parliament, feeling like there was so much energy in the room. We had dozens of commissioners. And we had Ursula von der Leyen there herself saying, this is the priority. And then suddenly everything got exploded in a way we didn't expect. I remember you well there, Jen, uh, on top form moderating that event and what a fantastic event it was. And I think what's been useful in that period, that consultation that uh, the EU launched was a lot of coming together that Antonella was talking about there. All of the different constituents working in providing cancer care, the oncologists, the nurses, the pharmacists, the experience of patients, all of that has come together with charities foundations, the healthcare industry, everybody's got a part to play. And in that one year consultation period, a huge energy started to be mobilized around what the beating cancer plan could achieve. And then COVID hit, and then we started to realize that it was even more important than we thought it was um, to be able to get this right. So I think, you know, I was, I was seeing what Stella said today uh, she said, we can't continue to address health crises as we have done before COVID. Business as usual is not an option. And that's 100% right. We've seen with our own eyes, through our own difficult experience, through our own losses, like Mark was describing earlier, that pretending that um, cancer is, is a one nation, nation by nation issue is just not practical. It's not right. And it, it's not what citizens want. 
So the reactions that we've seen, the teamwork that we've seen in the response to COVID has been tremendously important in dealing with the pandemic, but shown us a bit of an example of what's possible if we put our minds to it. And what I think about the Beating Cancer Plan, I've been very impressed and our members and our patient groups have been very impressed with the momentum that has been maintained on the implementation of the, of the Beating Cancer Plan. Lots of work to do for Stella and John Ryan and Sandra Galina and their teams, but we are with them. We, are, we have a responsibility as a European cancer community to get this right this time. Because if we don't get it right this time with 4 billion euros behind us, with all of the political will that's behind us, we'll never get it right. And we've got an absolutely fundamental opportunity here to demonstrate for all of public health that this is achievable across borders. And some of the initiatives that we've seen during the pandemic, the collaboration between member states on the vaccine passports, for example, the great work ECDC has done in tracking um, the re response to the pandemic. This shows what's achievable if we are together agile. And I use that word deliberately, agile. It's a word Stella used today as well in, um, with the Becker Committee. If we, if we demonstrate teamwork and agility, we've got a chance of making that beating cancer plan um, a success and to achieve what it's set out to do. Thank you very much, Mike. And, and I'm glad you mentioned the COVID passports because although our audience voted for the two other subjects, it is worth remembering that the, you know, the digital health, the new technologies, that interoperability that we talk about in say the tech sector is also a big part of what might give us a kind of joined up thinking on cancer across Europe. So. Again, I'm really keen to hear from the audience. You voted. Do use the chat function or the Q&A function to tell us why you voted the way you did. Alexander, let me turn to you. I mean, obviously you've been listening closely all day to what's being discussed. Are you surprised about the way our audience voted this evening on the subjects we want to talk about? Oh, typical questions. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe people are, are uh, tired about COVID and uh, want to look uh, into the future. I hope so, uh, because I think I, I very much like the topic of, of Gastein uh, because um, I think we see somewhat a, a phoenix uh, in many ways uh, raising again. Uh, on the one hand, uh, I think the, the, the economy has somewhat uh, recovered. I think this is really important because this will also impact healthcare. Um, but uh, secondly, also, I believe for Europe's beating cancer plan and, and Mark and, and Mike and Antonella have pointed to this. Uh, is is probably even more important. I also remember the event in the European Parliament at that time, and and at that time maybe when when this was launched, it was a bit like a vision. And uh, if COVID told us something, uh, it it means that this vision has to come into action. Uh, Mark made a very important comment in terms of uh, where we were with cancer care before the pandemic. Um, just one example we we often we often quote is is uh, when I think of skin cancers. Uh, within a few years, we were able to to increase five year survival by ten years. and and this is this is incredible. also when we see that mortality actually uh, isn't growing as fast as as incidents. So that means less people die of cancer than than people uh, getting cancer. And this is a huge success and, and there was a risk with COVID that we, we would be um, put back and, and have to restart again. Um, the plan is, contains a few very important pillars. I think uh, one, one, one which stands out is really the, the focus on, on early diagnosis. And uh, again, COVID told us that what happens if you do not diagnose? You miss out patients, patients develop cancer, and, and they, they end up in having a metastatic cancer. And early diagnosis is so critically important that we very much support also the, the respective flagship initiatives. Another one which has been um, uh, mentioned also by, by Antonella is, is prevention. We have tools at hand and, and the plan is very clear in terms of, of uh, hepatitis, uh, sorry, HPV-related <laughs> vaccinations. 
here we can do something very simply if we if we achieve the goals of, of vaccination rates. And then I also believe that uh, cancer is, is not something which you only tackle by a medicine, by a vaccine, or by a tobacco anti-tobacco program. It's really multidisciplinary, and therefore the the um, the approach to to bring these these comprehensive cancer centers together is essential. It's it's a multidisciplinary effort, and I think as Mike mentioned, uh, we all have to work together. So not a, not the industry alone, nor patient advocacy groups, nor the European Commission uh, can tackle cancer. It requires a bit uh, uh, a broader approach, and therefore. I, we were very supportive as as industry association of this uh, Europe's beating cancer plan because it took a little bit this broader perspective. Thank you, Alexander. I noticed there, um, Mark, you've commented in the chat saying that you know this idea of a national competency should be chucked in the dustbin of history. Do you want to comment on that in in light of what you've seen as people's uh, or audiences' votes on what they think is important? And obviously, the EU cancer plan was the top on their agenda. Absolutely, Jennifer. I mean, I, I just think that we're in a totally different world now. I think COVID has shown us, you know, how resilient we can be. Uh, and I think, you know, all bets are off in relation to how we regarded health. And the other thing is that the European Commission, both the President, the Health Commissioner, have really, uh, really, you know, sort of said that, you know, we want to have health in all competencies in relation to all aspects of life. Um, so I, I think the you know that statement really annoys me now, and I think it should annoy everybody uh, because it's a cop out. Uh, we really need to work together. That's how we've achieved the vaccination rates we've had. That's how we've developed testing quickly. Why can't we do it for cancer? I, I'm arguing if we can have COVID statistics every day, why can't we have cancer statistics every day? And so it's really important that we totally change the mindset and really reimagine a better care system for all our patients, for all our citizens through all of Europe. Absolutely. And again, it wasn't chosen for our discussion today, but these, 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 the e-health card that they want to share across all of Europe is one way at least to show that some people are thinking about this, that you can, even if you exercise your European right to free movement between countries, get a consistent health care. Now we have a question. Thank you very much. Anonymous attendee who has put this question to all the speakers. What is your perspective on the trade-off to be made between screening and prevention and investing in treatments? Do the economic harms of scaling up screening outweigh the benefits? Now, I'm going to have a guess that you've probably got a strong answer to this, Antonella. Well, uh, of course, uh, one doesn't exclude the other and cannot uh, undermine the other. So screening and early detection are, uh, are fundamental. They can be vital for cancer patients, uh, so as uh, treatments. And uh, uh, for us, uh, I mean, there is, uh, uh, I mean, the cost is not uh, as relevant as uh, saving life, a life. Uh, of course, uh, we need uh, to consider the economical impact of any intervention. I mean, we are, uh, um, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, our main aim is uh, to save uh, the lives, uh, uh, lives of patients. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, we consider the cost of this uh, and uh, the cost should not be uh, the, the first priority. Uh, but uh, we uh, do believe that uh, um, uh, screening uh, is uh, fundamental, but at the same time, uh, the um, treatment, innovative treatments uh, must be uh, available to cancer patients everywhere in Europe. Of course, those sorts of in innovative, <laughs> innovative treatments do require investment. Mike, I'm going to get an answer from you and then I will go over. We have, I've got a comment from an MEP in our audience as well. Yeah, I mean, I very much agree with Antonella. I think, I think it's about having a range of measures across the piece, which is what the beating cancer plan tries to do. Of course, it's always better if you can stop people from uh, getting cancer in the first place. And the flagship policy around HPV vaccination, for example, is very relevant to that. Um, the screening guidelines, I think everybody would agree the screening guidelines need updating and expanding and, uh, and there's opportunities for that. But as I put in the chat there, I think this is about maximizing political will because this, we've been waiting for this bus for quite a long time 
and now it's arrived, um, there are uh, a lot of initiatives that will be um, that will be used to be able to implement the beating cancer plan across all of the different DGs within the European Commission. But if you just look at the Special Committee on Beating Cancer, Becca, the number of amendments there were to the Becca report demonstrates the level of engagement from MEPs at, at the EU level. But also, if you look at the uh, Mark mentioned the Time to Act campaign that he co-chairs with Miriam Cruel in 30 languages. When we've done national events around Time to Act, we've always been able to have the National Health Minister there because they recognize the importance and the negative impact that COVID has had on cancer. So I think that that gap that has been in existence, as Mark was saying about national competence, is, is narrowing in political terms. But whatever we do, we need to maximize the political will that's being demonstrated by the Commission, by the uh, European Parliament, and the resources that are being put behind the delivery of the plan. Thank you very much, Mike. Now, I see uh, Joseph Olegas, who is an MEP at the European Parliament, has joined our discussion today. Very briefly, you had to have a, a comment on our discussion. Uh, indeed, I agree with uh, many of what was said here, but <clears throat> I think that we should go uh, further because uh, uh, it's very difficult to achieve, as was mentioned, uh, country by country, the result. We need more um, united efforts from European Union and for that, maybe uh, health union. I know we're discussing about um, the future of uh, uh, conference of future of Europe, uh, and maybe we need to, to take more uh, power for for commission uh, that we can, um, for example, raise the, the minimum standards for early diagnosis. It was mentioned the uh, innovative medicine. Maybe we can talk about or think about that. Uh, as uh, with the COVID, uh, with uh, uh, vaccines, when we get it uh, together, maybe also about the possibilities to get this innovative message through the European Union model and to present for, for patients in, in different countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for your input. Um, Alexander, I'm going to come to you for that final word on that question from our audience regarding whether there's a trade-off between screening and prevention and investing in treatments. I, I, I completely concur with Antonella because what matters is what benefits patients most or even make sure that patients do not become cancer patients if you can do this. Um, but uh, one other point I, I wanted to, to, uh, to mention is uh, I have a global role and I see a little bit this, this uh, unique EU situation. So it's, I think it's the only region in the world which has a plan. <laughs> all, the others, all the other regions have, have national plans and it's highly fragmented. So I think this is the, the real opportunity we have here in Europe. I know member states have their competences and, and remits, etc. The other thing I, I wanted to mention, and maybe this can overcome the, the differences between member states, is if, if we jointly agree on objectives. I think, um, as Antonella said, the inequalities registry is extremely important and is certainly a priority of the European Union to, to, uh, to reduce inequalities in general, be it in cancer, but also elsewhere. Nevertheless, I think uh, being ambitious and also to agree on objectives where we want to be in 10 years, 15 years, and doing this together with member states, stakeholders, uh, institutions, etc., that would be an even stronger signal and, and probably also make the vision coming into reality. Thank you, Alexander. Um, we're going to move on now to the next part of our discussion. And that was about, I mean, you talked about, we quite, quite nicely lead into it, about how we can ensure continuing progress in cancer care and whether a set of jointly agreed indicators would help. In, in, in layman's terms, measuring the, the impact we're having. Um, that, was, that was certainly ranked by our audience very closely behind the EU cancer plan, something they wanted to talk about. And so for the second half hour of our discussion today, we're gonna to talk about that and we're gonna lead into a political discussion. I'll bring in some more, more excellent panelists as we go along. But Antonella, let me come to you to talk about this this idea of measuring and, and how we can do that better going forward. 
Well, uh, a value-based uh, system that is uh, driven by high quality comparable data, including outcomes uh, that matter to people and patients, uh, that can be collected and analyzed in real time is essential. Uh, we believe uh, that uh, what get, gets uh, measured uh, gets done. I mean, this is becoming now my slogan since uh, a few months. So uh, notably, uh, monitoring and reporting on key indicators at EU level can help uh, chart progress and target improvement. Uh, the, we, we, we are suggesting uh, a, a framework uh, and the, the, the governance of this monitoring tool should be very broad and allow the active participation of all relevant uh, stakeholders uh, and specifically that of cancer patients in my case. As uh, cancer patients need to feel empowered, uh, they need to have a say uh, and uh, the monitoring tool uh, will allow better management of resources and ultimately better health outcomes. Uh, we all uh, know that one major obstacle during COVID-19 has been the difficulty in assessing the impact of the pandemic and comparing interventions and public health measures adopted in different regions and countries uh, due to the lack of a comparable real-time data. So the EU must encourage the adoption of harmonized health data standards and open exchange formats of electronic health records. Uh, this framework should be uh, evidence-based uh, and uh, continually evolve as, a common indicator, as common indicators become agreed and available. Uh, what's more, it should cover the four main pillars in the Europe's beating cancer plan, as well as inequalities, the cancer burden, patient involvement uh, in the research, as a unifying glue connecting the work horizontally across the pillars. So to conclude, there is a need for a set of jointly agreed indicators designed and appointed, uh, designed by a, an expert group, uh, representative of member states, experts, healthcare professionals and patients. And uh, we are committed uh, to assist the uh, EU institutions in the development of this framework. Thank you, Antonella. Mike, let me come to you again. I mean, we've seen with COVID again, we keep coming back to this huge unwanted, but very salient example to compare other things against that measuring and, and charting was very important. And yet trying to get some consistency around the globe wasn't always easy. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, I mean, I very much agree with what Antonella says, and that's not a surprise because we work very closely with ECPC and FPA on this topic of measurement because we think it's extremely important. We think that the plan cannot be a success unless we demonstrate the progress that has been made uh, by the implementation of the beating cancer plan. We, we, we believe that uh, the right kind of measurements will empower patients, of course, but will also empower uh, politicians and policymakers to see the progress that they're making. Of course, any kind of measurement needs to be seen in a constructive way in, in relation to saving and improving lives through cancer. We know that there's a lot of inequality uh, in cancer care right now across member states, even within member states. So it's a question about the tone of that measurement needs to be a constructive one this isn't a we don't want a, a penalty system where people uh, member states feel like they're getting a red card because of what's happening in their member state this is about encouraging um the right the right investment and the right um improvements to be made but investing in the beating cancer plan without that kind of measurement would would seem would seem a little uh, naive would seem a little bit uh, empty potentially in terms of measuring its impact we're of course very excited and uh, looking forward to hearing what the cancer inequalities registry will mean in in tangible terms uh, we know oecd has been appointed by the commission to to work on that and we've got some conversations coming up with OECD um, on, on that. But I, I, think, I think there's a consensus amongst oncologists, nurses, pharmacists, patients, and the healthcare industry that 
you know, we really need to be able to measure the invest uh, the success of the investment that's that's uh, that's going in. That the public need to understand it. That all stakeholders need to be represented in its creation, as Antonella said. And we want this to be a simple process. We don't want to spend five years talking about what we should be measuring. There are measures out there that we can bring together quite quickly, and um, and hopefully start demonstrating the difference the plan is making. Thank you. I mean, Alexander, obviously, this sort of measurement is essential. We want to understand what works and what doesn't. But at the same time, nobody wants to be reduced to a number. So how do we bring in the voices of everyone into creating some sort of measurement? Um, no, Mike alluded a little bit to the, the collaboration we had. And, and I think we had a discussion about measurement already last year. And, uh, what I believe is is to make it relevant. Uh, one important principle is that it should be public facing. Um, I think in the end, uh, the cancer plan is is for EU citizens and not for scientists. <laughs> so I think they need to see the benefit, and uh, this will also ensure that uh, the measuring is is uh, accountable. So no, that the plan is accountable to the patients because in the end, it, the patient is, is the person who can judge whether there has been progress. The, the other thing is, is uh, indicators have also certain normative power. That means what we, as Antonella said, what we measure gets done. So that means it's, it's really important what we want to achieve with Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. And then from this follows, follows the indicator, uh, which tells us whether we our move from A to B has been successful or not. There is always a risk also that you start to um, give, uh, give numbers like in school. And, and I think this has to be treated in a very careful manner because I think the, these numbers or the ratings are not to, um, to blame people, but uh, to, to, in, to improve. But I think the most important, and it has been mentioned also in the chat is, is this is, is the public, so public facing. And, and I think uh, making them understandable, so also health literacy adapted <laughs> in a way, so that uh, regular citizens uh, just understand what is happening and whether we are achieving what we have committed to. Thank you, Alexander. I'm going to bring in now our sort of second round of uh, panelists. So I'm very pleased to see joining us from the European Parliament taking time out of his very busy schedule. We have Christian Silvu Bouchoy, who is going to talk to us in just a second. I also want to invite Urshka Erklavik to switch on her camera as well. Urshka is joining us as a representative of the Slovenian Presidency of the Council and from the Ministry of Health in Slovenia. Thank you very much. And also last but not least, John Ryan, Director of Public Health, Country Knowledge and Crisis Management Directorate in the European Commission. Thank you uh, very much for joining us. Christian, let me start with you. We're talking now about measurement. So I want to know about how you feel publicly shared goals and indicators can, can bring the, the future of cancer care forward. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for, uh, for the invitation and uh, Sorry that I cannot uh, be on the whole uh, event as I have to go back to ITRE committee that I'm chairing uh, to conclude the meeting. And uh, then, uh, uh, because President von der Leyen is in Romania, today, they'll have to go for a few minutes live on Romanian television. Uh, yes, I believe that uh, it is extremely important to, to, to build trust. And uh, in order to do that, uh, we need to have uh, the most accurate data and to have the best cancer plans that. Uh, we can uh, build. Um, what I would like to convey to uh, the Gastein Forum, and I'm happy to see that even in times of uh, uh, pandemics, uh, without the possibility to be in the same room, uh, the forum, the Gastein Forum is setting the scene. What I would like to convey is the strong commitment on behalf of uh, European Parliament in general and behalf of uh, the committees uh, directly involved uh, in the issue that uh, cancer is clearly a strong public health priority and a strong political priority for um, European Parliament. And I saw this uh, when uh, we discussed uh, 
Horizon Europe. Horizon Europe is extremely important for the committee that I'm chairing, Industry Research and Energy Committee. And you know that uh, uh, the only mission that it was decided before the legislation was adopted, uh, uh, the only mission in the area of healthcare was the mission for cancer. And uh, cancer is clear a uh, strong priority for researchers in the uh, future years. I was also uh, witnessed the importance uh, and the commitment, the political commitment and the special attention to cancer when uh, we discussed, uh, adopted in European Parliament and then negotiated with the Council, the program EU for Health. I was the rapporteur on behalf of uh, European Parliament and uh, among other uh, important priorities and directions, uh, and uh, here clearly we need to be better prepared for the future, for crisis, we need to digitalize our healthcare sectors. We have to fight against medium and long-term challenges. But among all this, uh, cancer, tackling cancer, fighting uh, against cancer was uh, a very much supported uh, priority of the program. And um, here, uh, of course, not only uh, cancer registries, not only uh, you beating cancer plan uh, actions that will be also supported from uh, you for health program, but many other uh, opportunities uh, could be at the disposal of uh, you, of uh, um, European uh, medical doctors, uh, researchers, uh, academics. Also, the partnership and dialogue with industry is extremely important. So the commitment of European Parliament is very clear. We need the best data. We need the best measurements. We need to build trust. We need to have accurate cancer plans. Unfortunately, we still have member states which did not develop until now a cancer plan. Many others will have to update. And uh, this is something that we should do now in order to reach our goals. Thank you very much. I think echoing a lot of what our previous panelists were saying as well from a perspective of being joined up and, and, and thinking in a joined up way across Europe. Um, Ursula, I'm going to come to you next, and of course I should say supported by her colleague Dr. Tit Albrecht, who is the key expert on uh, cancer care in the Slovenian National Institute of Public Health and Associate Professor at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ljubljana. Uh, Tit, we'll bring you in in a moment, but Ursula, give us this political perspective on, that, that Christian was mentioning. Exactly, yeah, thank you for your word. Um, yeah, so for Slovenia, uh, holding the presidency of the Council of EU currently, uh, we have one of the four key priorities for us is also cancer, besides strengthening um, health systems and addressing uh, medicine accessibility and availability, which is also partly um, um, part of the cancer field, and global health. Um, and when I mention our priorities, I would also like to say that cancer has been already a priority for Slovenia during our first presidency of the Council EU in 2008. And we're therefore very happy to see that cancer is now so high on the EU agenda. Um, and for us, we also see, if I echo some of the, the things my colleagues said before, it's very important to have cancer at focus of all time, also during the pandemic, since the cancer will stay at the forefront of our health challenges, even after we have the pandemic under control. Um, and here I would also like to refer to the very ambitious Europe's beating cancer plan, which we think is very important step in the right direction. We are looking forward to also seeing the presentation of the roadmap in the coming weeks. And we really feel that the implementation of this uh, Europe's beating cancer plan represents an upgrade uh, to the individual activities that have already been done uh, so far at EU level. Um, and it's also important that um, this plan is one of the pillars of the strong European health union in the future. Um, and of course, it's, uh, it, this plan is a political commitment to turn the tide against cancer while also addressing health determinants. Um, and here it's important that we have this health in all policies approach um, and that's why this is also an important stepping stone um, for um, also, in general, a more secure and better prepared and more resilient um, EU. And um, if I maybe just refer a bit more to, to data uh, that was mentioned just before, um, and uh, I think here I can be, we're in Slovenia, we're very proud that we have a cancer registry. 
uh, which is one of the oldest population-based registries in Europe, because it was already founded in 1950s, uh, in 1950. And um, here, it's, it's important also to say that data really can save lives, and that's why we feel it's important that we have these measurements, that we're monitoring what's happening, um, and that we also see um, which actions are actually uh, effective in our um, in what we're doing. And just lastly, and most important point I would like to make is that we must never forget our first priority should be also cancer prevention, uh, because preventing cancer whenever possible can eliminate around 40% of all cancer cases if we, of course, successfully translate our understanding of risk into protective factors uh, and then into effective primary prevention, which means that it's important to invest in prevention to address determinants of health, reduce health inequalities and protect vulnerable groups. That's for now, thank you. Thank you, Erska. I know I, it's, it's quite a challenge to squeeze so much into one hour. And I have a question for the audience. Um, you can follow the link there in the chat and uh, or follow the QR code or put in the topic on Slido, you've just put in EHFGS4. We're asking you what should be the number one priority in cancer care going forward. I'm going to let you vote on that, put in one word, put in two, put them separately. Um, while we hear from John Ryan from the European Commission, John, we're talking about data, we're talking about measurement. You heard there, data can save lives. Is that the view of the Commission as well? And, and how do we make it work? What is the call to action, if you like, going forward? Yeah, I think it's important to, um, to have indicators to follow the progress of, uh, of any action plan. I'm also dealing with the antimicrobial resistance action plan for the Commission. We're now in the second version. And I think it's really important that we're able to track uh, whether things have been done or not done. And that's not only a question of spending money, I mean, it's really great that uh, we've had the support of the European Parliament in order to identify the resources for the cancer mission, the resources for EU for Health. But I think uh, there are other indicators which we need to develop quickly, and not in five years' time. We need to develop them quickly. We need to take existing indicators where we have them and try and model them and use them for, for our purposes. Because having been involved in many of these different policy areas before, uh, you can get very quickly lost if you try and, and strive for the perfect solution. I think it's really important that we have convincing, simple indicators which speak to citizens as well, so that they're not accompanied by 100 footnotes on each occasion and that uh, we have something which speaks to citizens and shows that this European effort for citizens, European effort for cancer prevention and cancer care is something that's having an effect on the ground. And there was a reference made earlier on to the inequalities registry. And I think this is a new innovative idea. I'm not acquainted with any other policy area in the European Union where we have set up a registry. Now it's not a statistical registry of inequalities. The idea is to be able to capture where there are gaps, where there are differences, and then to be able to use that indicator or that a registry to channel investments or to channel efforts. Because I think the Commission's uh, golden thread through the whole uh, cancer program was really to try and find a solution that would not make things better necessarily for those at the top and leave uh, the majority of countries behind, but rather to reduce the gaps between the member states. And that's really, I think, the key message I wanted to give here that the inequalities registry while it might seem like uh, an extra add-on to the cancer program, it is in fact the cornerstone of the cancer program, I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Christian, since I know you have to leave us very shortly, let me give a, a second word to you. What, what in, you know, very briefly, what do you think is the, the way forward in getting some kind of joined up measurement tool together for the EU in terms of cancer care? I think the most important is to uh, convince the member states in order to uh, really uh, make concrete moves uh, in, uh, in the direction of, of course, uh, the situation is very different as we witnessed, as we discussed, uh, 
uh, unfortunately, the political, political commitment is also uh, unequal. Uh, it is clear uh, that uh, there is a strong political commitment at European level coming from uh, President von der Leyen, coming from who, the most important actors. Also, the presidencies of the Council uh, put it a lot of emphasis, uh, tried to uh, advance uh, in this direction. Do not forget about uh, the trio presidency, three joint declarations under the German presidency, the joint commitment on research under the Portuguese presidency, uh, the declaration on comprehensive translational cancer research approach, and also personalized and precision medicine, extremely important for cancer patients and to be successful. And uh, I'm happy to see also the Slovenian presidency and uh, here uh, recently the joint declaration on patient involvement in research. But still uh, in many, many member states, uh, uh, maybe some other issues are more, uh, more uh, actual, more present. Uh, of course, we are still fighting with pandemics. Here also the cancer patients were very much affected, uh, not only those which were infected, even those which were uh, not infected because, and it's very clear that we have data, we have a lot of uh, statements, we have a lot of situations that uh, the situation was worse uh, in terms of access, in terms of di diagnosis, in terms of treatment. So the most important is to, to go and pressure the member states and especially those member states which, where uh, maybe the political commitment uh, uh, is not yet as strong as it should be. Well, thank you, Christian. It's, a, it's an uphill task, of course, getting uh, all the member states to sing from the same hymn sheet, but uh, good luck with it and, and good luck with going back to your ETRIC committee now. We appreciate it. Um, do keep voting using Slido. We are going to come back and have a quick look at that before we wrap up. But Tit, I'm going to bring you in now. Thank you for your patience ready to be the last speaker. Um, I'm going to point to a question that's come in from our audience, which has said, we've recently seen distrust against science, medical personnel and government action on health. Do you expect this trend to create skepticism also in the area of chronic diseases, including cancer? And what I'm going to add to that, just to keep in with the theme of what we're discussing is whether a sort of publicly understandable data measuring tool might be a way to combat that skepticism. Yes, uh, thank you, Jennifer, for, for the floor. Uh, I think it's, uh, I will quote actually Mark and uh, also John indirectly uh, on, on data. One of the problems with COVID is not only the fake news and um, all the deceiving campaigns around vaccines, but more importantly, the, uh, the public being flooded with numbers. And I always say, you know, if you present to the general public with logarithmic curves and exponential curves, only a fraction of them will actually understand what it is and what it means. I, I see uh, appalling uh, reactions sometimes on Twitter and elsewhere uh, on misunderstandings this creates. I think that we, on chronic diseases, the things are maybe a little bit easier for us. I don't want to overestimate uh, the clarity, but I think that we, we have more understanding, we have more knowledge on the links, also in the general population. I think that the Commission set out an important challenge to address alcohol and cancer, I have to say, because we stress the importance of prevention. And I think this, this for Europe as the number one continent in consumption of alcohol per capita in the world, obviously, is very important. I think that the clear presentation of data and occasional in-depth analysis, not only on survival, but also on the quality of life and uh, on the social inequalities already mentioned, might help drive the public's attention in the right direction, because then we might get mobilization for uh, the activities that have been clearly outlined. I would say, as I wrote also on Slido, access and prevention are probably socially looking the most important lev levers uh, to uh, address the future challenges in cancer. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm keeping an eye there on the chat as well. Mark is uh, mentioning that an easily understood dashboard that patients and citizens can use should be the way to go. I think 
to that that's a sort of uh, echoing what you say about not flooding people with numbers they don't understand but giving them a really easy way to visualize what's happening let's have a look uh speaking of an easy way to visualize things at the word cloud prevention is the number one thing that people are mentioning but we're also seeing patient oriented community community we're seeing diagnosis prevention 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 again unity amongst member states we're also seeing data connectivity measurement equality testing access measuring what works and what doesn't and improving access to timely diagnosis i think in a few different ways people have said access is something else uh, and we've seen data as another separate issue there so data prevention access patients patient centered really i think certainly but focusing on prevention first so as a final kind of wrap up i am very well aware that we are very close to time and we only had one hour I'm going to ask each of my panelists, including those from the prior session, so Antonella and Alexander, you want to come back in, just to comment on what you would have put as your word in that word cloud. But John, I'm going to let you go first. What's your reaction? Or what would you have put in as your one, if you only had one word? Surprised you picked me first, but anyway. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm really impressed with the, the commitment of everybody online. I'm really impressed as well by the support we have for the cancer plan. And I think it's really important that we keep this uh, spirit of, of innovation and renewal and, and mutual support moving in the same direction. That's really important. We're not in this to, to compete in any way, but to work together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, we haven't heard from you for a while, but I see you're being very engaged in the chat and the online. So what would your one word have been? Patience. Okay. <laughs> uh, in both senses, I wonder. <laughs> exactly. Pa being patient and serving patients. <laughs> Tish, let me hear your, your word. What would you have written in the word cloud if you could only have one chance? And you're also on mute. Yes, uh, I, I would, I would uh, stress prevention. Uh, not because it's the most commonly quoted word, but I think it is the key for the future reduction in in the cancer burden uh, overall. And Ershka? I would also go with prevention and health promotion. <laughs> okay. Um, Alexander, your thoughts? Um, innovate, but um, in a broader sense, so from prevention to detection to treatment and to quality of life. Thank you. Mike? Unity. We need goals that unify us. We need to measure how we're doing. We need to be united politically. We need to be united as a European cancer community. We need to make this happen now. Thank you. And Antonella, last but not least, I've tried to squeeze everyone in. We're at 17, 59 minutes. <laughs> Well, uh, I would say equality. So equality in uh, accessing prevention, uh, treatment, uh, uh, everything. Equality uh, in front of uh, uh, policymakers. So equality. Well, thank you. Across and Europe. Europe. Of course. Yes. And I'm going to take my prerogative as the moderator to say mine would have been data, which has come to no surprise to anyone I know who knows me. I, I talk about data all the time because it can be just turned to every use. Thank you very much to all our panelists. It's been a really lively discussion. And thank you so much to the audience for driving us and pushing us and pulling us in the directions that you wanted to hear about. I hope you've really enjoyed this session and that you will continue to enjoy the forum overall and stay engaged with your questions. Use the hashtag, share on social media, share with your colleagues, share with your friends. Um, we're, we're going to really try and work forward for next steps. So today's discussion, albeit brief, will not be forgotten. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening.